Well, hello everyone. This is Mike Howard and I am here with Beverly Howard. We're going to do a Bible study. We're in our second lesson in the book of Genesis, the chapter 2, verses 7 through 9 and also verses 15 through 25. Title of this lesson is The First Couple. So last week we talked about chapter one, which was the story of creation. And now in chapter two, God is going to focus specifically on the creation of man and woman. So it's Genesis, in the beginning. Before I get started, if you're a teacher, a Bible study teacher, there are some excellent additional resources that I found for Genesis chapter two. There are two theme videos from the Bible Project. One is titled Water of Life and the other The Tree of Life. And the other is three sermons from John MacArthur on chapter two of Genesis. The uh, description of this video has the links to all of those resources. So let's get started. In chapter two, in chapter one uh, of Genesis, God is referred to as Elohim, uh, the Hebrew word Elohim, which means God, but it can mean a generic God, but he's the creator God in chapter one. But when we get to chapter two, uh, the writer of Genesis, Moses, changes God's name from Elohim to Yahweh Elohim, which is a covenant name. It's an Israelite covenant name for God. It's a personal God uh, uh, of Yahweh. So it, the first word, it's two words, and it's, it's in here, uh, I think, 11 times uh, uh, in chapter 2. Uh, Yahweh, or Jah, or Lord, or the I Am. Remember when Moses encountered God in the burning bush, he says, I am that I am. Well, that's Yah, Yah, okay? Jesus is Yahshua, or Joshua, okay? And that means Lord of salvation. Hallelujah means praise to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the second word is the Lord God. So Lord is uh, uh, Jehovah, or Yahweh, and the second word is Elohim, which is, means God. So details of chapter two. The first man is Adam. God creates a garden for Adam and lots of water, lots of trees and other plants with food that Adam uh, and all the other animals can eat. Adam is the only one, however, that God has created at this point from, uh, that does not have a mate. Uh, because in Genesis chapter one, uh, the creation story says he created them male and female. But we find Adam at this point on day six without a female. So God is going to create the female uh, for Adam and her name will be Eve. He doesn't name her until chapter three. Uh, so God creates Eve in a very unique way. Remember, all of the animals uh, in chapter one were created from the dust of the earth, including Adam but not Eve. And I know you know the, the story, but kind of hang on and let me get to it. <laughs> Finally, there is a lesson in chapter two about marriage. And that may sound unusual, but it's not. In chapters one and two, there are some interesting parts that point us to what God has designed in terms of our relationship with marriage. So chapter two details about man. So in chapter one, it was an overall creation experience, day one, two, three, four, five, six, and then of course day seven was the day of rest. And then you get to chapter two, and it's, it starts out this way. This is the account of the uh, human family, the generations of the human family. So this is a, an account of mankind of the heavens and earth. And if your your translation may just say that this is an account of the heavens of the creation of the heavens and the earth, but that's a poor translation if it's an NIV because you have to go over to the King James or the ESV. It inserts the Hebrew word which is in the Hebrew, which stands for generations of human the human family. Now, how do we know that this is important? Follow this. If you take a look at from chapters two all the way through the rest of the Bible, uh, the uh, God is going to talk about the account of certain human generations. For example, in two four, it's the account of all human generations, 
And in, count, and in, God, in uh, Genesis 5, this is a written account of Adam's family line. In chapter 6, this is the account of Noah and his family line. Chapter 10, this is the account of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, which were th the three sons of Noah. Chapter 11, the account of Shem's family. Chapter 11, again, the account of Terah's family line, which, remember, Terah was Abraham's father. Chapter 25, the account of the family line of Ishmael, which is the first son of Abraham. And then again in chapter 25, the account of the family line of Abraham's son Isaac. So all of that to say, this chapter 2 is not a second creation story. It is simply detail about the man part of the creation story, day six. So God is going to focus us in chapter two of Genesis on the man, the Adam, okay, and his soon-to-be wife, Eve. So details about man. Let me go back and read that verse over. This is the account of the generations of the human family of the heavens and the earth. And then we're going to go to verse seven, which is what our focal lesson starts on. And it's Adam in the first, as the first man on day six. The Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground. So we go back to day six. This is going to be a recap. This We got to go back and tag the creation story to bring us up to date. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. So we saw that in chapter one. Now we're going to see a lot more about who that man is and what God does with that man. So follow along. Now God, the Lord God, remember the Lord God, which is the, the covenant term for God. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden. And we don't know where Eden is was because after the flood, the kind of the rivers and the terrain was changed in a great way. But it seems like it's probably where the promised land is today or around the Middle East because the Euphrates River uh, is still in that area. So the garden to the east of Eden, and there he put the man that he'd formed. So now we know where the first man was placed, and that is in a garden that God had prepared for him. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees that grow out of the ground and trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. So one thing we know about the garden so far is, of course, Adam is there. Lots of animals are there. And now we see that trees, and we're going to find out other plants are there. So there's plenty for Adam to eat. In the middle of the garden, however, there were two special trees. In the middle of the garden, there was the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And uh, you might want to remember that because those two trees are going to come back a little bit later, as you know. <laughs> so now we're going to skip over verses 10 through 14, but let me tell you what's in those verses. We're going to find out that in this garden, because there wasn't any rain at this point, rain didn't happen until later, uh, the garden was watered from springs. Now here in uh, Homosassa and Crystal River, where we live, uh, there's, we call this the area where there are seven springs or seven rivers. Uh, matter of fact, a lot of the, a lot of the businesses around here are called seven springs or seven rivers, or, uh, you know, we have Homosassa Springs, uh, Crystal River, Homosassa River. There are seven different rivers that come from seven different springs just in this part of Florida. And that's kind of the way it was in the Garden of Eden. There was one spring that that the water came out of and that formed a great river. And from that river formed four other rivers. And one, of course, one of those is the Euphrates. And, uh, and then since there was, oh, okay. So the, they provided all the water for the garden. So now I'm going to go to verse 15. The Lord God took the man, Adam, and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. So he wasn't do it planting crops at this point in time. We find out that the crops come later after the fall. So there wasn't a need to plant crops because there was plenty of food from the plants and the trees, fruit from the trees. So Adam didn't have to plant anything. He just more or less took care of <clears throat> the plants that were there and the animals that were there to take care of the garden. So God then goes on to tell Adam, everything in this garden is yours. Every, everything is yours. And the Lord commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but. 
you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now, John MacArthur in his sermons uh, talks about the fact that he believes that this tree wasn't poison, it, that it was the fruit from this tree was just fine. It's just that God had forbidden Adam to eat from this tree because once that tree was, once he had eaten the fruit of this tree, he would understand evil. And it turns out that evil was simply disobeying God's command. So, so he's learning the act of eating it was the, actually the act of acquiring the knowledge of good and evil. Interesting approach. But we're going to find out that all of this happened and Adam was by himself. He was alone. The Lord uh, God, verse 18, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man, Adam, to be alone. I will make a helper who is suitable for him. In other words, I'm going to, I have to create a female version of Adam's for him because he's, he's Adam's not going to be able to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth just by himself. So I've got to make him a, a, a mate. <clears throat> Now, at this point, all atoms, all atoms, all animals had been formed from the dust. Remember verse 19. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all of the wild animals, all the birds of the sky, all the domesticated animals. And he brought them to the man, that'd be Adam, to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that became its name. So that was one of Adam's first responsibilities was to name all of the creatures, all of the land animals, and all the birds. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But when he got through naming all these people, he looks around and he says, hey, every animal has had a male and a female that we've named here. But when I see, uh, look around, I don't see anyone who is a female version of me. So there's no suitable helper for Adam. So the Lord God said, uh, he said, uh, he caused the man, Adam, to fall into a deep sleep. And while Adam was sleeping, God took one of the man's ribs and then closed the place with flesh. Now, I want you to, to pause for a second and understand that of all the animals, of all the land-dwelling animals, the only creation that did not come from the dust of the earth was Eve, the woman. And that makes her extremely unique. It also says that Adam did not come from woman. He came from the dust of the earth. So that's a pretty good position against evolution. The, the word of God teaches us that he didn't evolve from some prehistoric, uh, pre-nomadic human so the only creature not from dust. And the Lord made the woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And then, then Adam, seeing the woman, breaks into poetry, which is, has continued to happen down through the ages. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So Adam is a he's not as happy as my puppy, but he's a happy guy. So now we get to verse 24, and Moses, through led by the Holy Spirit, uh, finishes up this story with an interjection about marriage. Verse 24 says, this is why, he's talking about the creation of Eve from Adam's rib, from his side, and, he, and Adam then proclaimed, this is uh, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And then Moses does what I would call an aside here, but it's really a main point. He says, this is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. So uh, almost out of the blue, uh, God wants us to pay attention to the fact that this is a symbol, a shadow uh, of marriage. And then the last verse here is because there was no evil at this point, there was no shame. So Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. So let's summarize this. So we had chapter one was the creation story. Now chapter two literally focuses on earth, on us, on exactly how God created the first man and the first woman and the location that they had and the vocation that they had that was taking care of the garden. Okay. 
So details about the first couple. Man is created in God's image and he's told to be fruitful and fill the earth, but there was no female. And then we have, we find out that there is a huge amount of symbolism that gets exposed here in chapter two. There's a garden and we find out that the garden, uh, the, the, the symbol of a garden goes throughout the Bible. So there's the Garden of Eden and there's the Promised Land, which is a garden. There's the Garden of Gethsemane and then heaven, which is the God's final garden for us to live in forever. So the whole symbolism of the garden goes throughout the Bible. The rivers, the rivers are, are literally God's life-giving force is this water that comes out of the ground, out of these rivers. Now, you can follow the river through, I remember, uh, I think it was Jacob uh, met his wife at a well. And fast forward a thousand or more years, and Jesus is standing at that same well talking to a, a Samaritan woman. And she brings water up from that same Jacob's well where he met his wife. This is, remember, uh, Adam met his wife right there at the waters from the Garden of Eden. And so she brings up this water and Jesus says to her, what? You know, I, you're going to drink this and get thirsty again, but I've got water. And if you drink my water, you'll never be thirsty again. So he is the giver of living water. So you've got the rivers and then you find... In heaven, there's going to be a river flowing from the throne of God. So there's the garden theme that goes throughout the Bible. There's the river theme that goes throughout the Bible. There are the two tree themes that go throughout the Bible. We've got the, the tree of life, and that tree of life we know is in the garden of Eden. But we also realize that the tree that gives life was the cross where Christ was crucified. And then we fast forward to uh, heaven, and there's another tree of life. And from that tree of life, which by the way is planted by the river that flows from the throne of God, is going to help us bear fruit for uh, 12 months out of the year. And then you have the unique creation of Eve, which points to uh, Adam being the Christ being the, the groom and the church being the bride. So you've got the church is created from the side of Christ, because remember, he was pierced on his side, and because of his death, we the, are the bride, we're created from his death. So you have that symbolism that flows throughout the Bible. So chapter two literally explodes with wonderful symbolism that carries from Genesis, early Genesis, all the way through Revelation chapter 22. And so you've got all of that from the first couple in chapter 22. God's perfect provision is also on display here where he provides the garden that's fully equipped with everything that the man needs. He provides the water, the food, and ultimately he provides the bride and Eve. God provides everything. And remember when the children of Israel are wandering in the wilderness God provided water from the rock. Remember, Christ was the rock and he provided manna. And, and Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I came down from heaven to give you life. Okay, so Jesus is both the water that comes from the rock. He's the rock that was stricken and he's the living water that comes out. And because he was stricken, and then he is the manna, which is the bread of life that comes to, to give us eternal life. So just like in the Garden of Eden, Jesus provides everything that we need for life and godliness, according to 2 Peter chapter 1. All right. Now, understanding and application. It's not a tough chapter to understand and apply, even though there's a tremendous amount of symbolism. Let's talk a little bit about what we see here. What can we learn? Well, we learned that Eden is the promised land, which is roughly the, the, the shadow of heaven. We learned that water brings life and Christ is the living water. We learned that the tree of life, like Moses, remember when Moses saw the burning bush that never burned up? That's the tree of life as well. Okay, so the burning bush, the cross is the tree of life, and then there's the tree of life. First man, Adam, and the second Adam is Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we find out that death came through the first Adam, and we'll find out about that next week, but eternal life comes through the second Adam. So 
there, there are two atoms that we're going to talk about that Paul talks about in uh, 1 Corinthians. And then Eve is from Adam, church is from Christ. So how do they, we, now we understand and we try to understand all that symbolism. And you know, it's, it's blowing my mind, all these symbols and all these themes that run through the Bible. But uh, they're consistent over 66 books, over 40 plus authors, and over thousands of years, these themes are consistent throughout God's word. From Genesis to Revelation, they confirm our faith in God's word and in Jesus as our savior and God's redemptive plan of Jesus dying for our sins on the cross. All of that goes all the way back to Genesis, all the way through to Revelation. And that, to me, in terms of, of, of application, when I see that, when I read that, when I understand that, it, it strengthens my faith, not only in God, but in the Word of God being the truth. So number one application is that strengthens me. But number two is recognizing that through all of this beautiful symbolism, the story and the plan that God's telling, God stops on a dime and he says, but wait, I want you to not skip over this. We need to emphasize in chapter one, I made them male and female. And in chapter two, I made them husband and wife, one flesh. That's my design for mankind. So pretty clear. Well, how do we know that's clear? We know it's clear from what Jesus said to the Pharisees, because the Pharisees are quizzing Jesus about divorce. And Jesus says to the Pharisees, hey, guys, and of course, this is, uh, you know, this is a little bit of a sarcasm here. He says, haven't you read? Well, the, supposedly they've read everything in the scriptures from front to back. They've memorized it all. Haven't you read, Jesus replied, that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female. That comes from Genesis chapter one. And number two, he says, and then God said, for this reason, a man shall will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. How much more clear, Jesus tells them, can God be what his perfect design is uh, for man and wife and for Christ and the church? And so through all of that symbolism, God wants to bring us back, bring us back, bring us back and say, look, my design, my perfect design before sin was male and female and that they would become one flesh and that the man would leave his mother and father and they would become one flesh. And that's my design for marriage. So what did we pick up from that, the application? One is tons of symbolism from first to end, but God wants us to stop and pay attention to the design of marriage. Now, there's a lot of brokenness in this world about our relationships, a man and wife, uh, a lot of divorce, a lot of uh, uh, serious relational issues. But God always wants to bring us back, bring us back, bring us back. This was and is my perfect design. So that's what you get out of chapter two. And that is God gave Adam Eve just as he gave Jesus the church. Mm -hmm. So pray with me. Father God, thank you for chapter two. Thank you for giving us some detail about Adam and his wife, Eve. Thank you for loving us so much that in spite of what happens next week, you gave us Jesus mm -hmm. to bring us back into the garden so that we can live with you for eternity. Yes. And for that, we will forever be grateful. Yes. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, that's the happy part of the story of Adam and Eve. The unhappy part of the story comes in our lesson next week when they decide to eat from the tree that God commanded them not to eat from. So until then, stay well, know that we love you. See you next week. Bye-bye.